Welcome back to Small Caps, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kerry Stevenson, and I've asked David Hunter to come back and have a conversation with us. The last time I spoke to David was in June of last year, where he started talking about the market melt up and then a potential crash, what's going on. And my apologies to our beautiful community out there. I've had a lot of you say, can you please get David Hunter back on? He's the <laughs> chief macro strategist at Con um, Contrarian Macro Advisors. And the last time we spoke, we spoke in depth about what was happening. We spoke about interest rates. So we're going to talk macro picture, what's happening with the Fed, and we might dive into the metals as well. So David, great to see you. Thanks for joining me on Small Caps today. Yeah, hi, Carrie. Good to see you too. David, just before we get started, for those people that don't know you, can you just give us a brief background? I know you spent a lot of time on Wall Street. And I guess um, as by way of background, just a little bit about why you call yourself a contrarian advisor. Sure. Um, yeah, I've, I've been doing this for, in June, it'll be 50 years. So um, <laughs> I can't believe how time flies. But um, I, I started out in banks on the buy side, moved from banking, uh, you know, managing trust money and, and uh, agency money, moved to a uh, pension fund. Uh, it was one of the Fortune 500 companies, actually Fortune 100 companies, had most of their pension assets in-house, and they brought me in to do their equities. Uh, I had a great run there. I was there five years and had top one percentile performance for the five years against the you know, the pension index or against the pension universe, uh, pension manager universe. Um, and that was back in the 80s. Uh, I went from there to um, Fidelity, managing, uh, actually managed some Australian money. I was in uh, on the international side. So I managed something called SFIT, um, which I think is kind of a social security fund over there, similar to our social security. Uh, and some others, and then managed uh, some big accounts in UK, uh, some banks in Japan, et cetera. And um, we, what it was, was I was running the US component of global funds, and Fidelity had it set up where the, you know, it was managed by local managers in, in the area. So, you know, for Europe, they had local managers over there doing it, and then we'd combine the portfolio. The US portion was mine. Uh, I went from there to running ITT Hartford Insurance Group's uh, active equity effort, and, and then uh, was a uh, chief investment officer for a, a billion-dollar fund called Chain and Wood in New York uh, back in the '90s. So that was my first half of my career was all buy side, you know, managing portfolios, institutional portfolios, and then. Um, switched over to the sell side as a uh, investment strategist, market strategist, uh, for the second half of my career, and been doing it ever since. And in terms of contrarian, I think probably I was born a contrarian. I mean, you know, it's pretty easy for me to walk outside the crowd. I I have through fifty years of observing other money managers and you know the whole industry. You know, the vast majority of people want to be with the crowd, whether they like it or not. They just are not comfortable being far outside the crowd and what I call a crowd, the consensus. Yeah. Um, and I just, uh, I'm happier when nobody agrees with me. In fact, I've done, had my best performance when nobody agrees with me. So, um, you know, lots of times people think you're dead wrong because you're the only one saying what you're saying or one of the few. And that's usually when I'm most, most confident that I'm right. So, uh, you know, case in point is right now. I mean, you know, everybody's assuming we are in a bear market and this is a bear market rally and that we're going a lot lower. And I keep saying, no, I'm very confident that we're going to go on to new highs and, and substantial new highs. So what leads you to believe that, uh, because, yeah, there's, there's a lot of people out there that's saying that there's going to be a pullback, that this, you know, we've had some banks in the U.S. fail uh, that this could be another 2008, but because there's so much debt out there increasing all the time, that it could be worse than 2008. But you're saying that potentially won't happen? Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, what I'm saying is all in good time. So, <laughs> uh, so I think because everybody got so bearish, and right now you've got so many people on one side of the boat that, as, as the Fed gets closer to the end of tightening, and I think they're very close, 
or certainly the end of this round of tightening, they're going to pause. As that happens, you're going to see a, a lot of people have to scramble from that side of the boat over to the other side. I think we're going to have a buying stampede. And I think people are going to find out what is meant by thin markets because with so many people positioned bearishly and all, you know, it's kind of the opposite of someone yelling fire in a crowded theater where everybody rushes for the exit and you, you have a stampede out. Um, this will be a stampede into the market where they all recognize in a very short period of time, in a fairly concentrated period of time, that they're mispositioned and that they need to move over from being short or being defensive into being more aggressively long. And as they try to get back positioned long, and as you get short covering, you're going to have not a lot of, you know, you're going to have to pay up to get those stocks because there's, you're all in, you're all on one side trying to buy from the very few people that are selling. So I, I think it, it can really move a market in a short period of time a long way. So that's, that's what I mean by a melt up. And, and, you know, part of it is, we are um, 80 years into more than 80 years into a super cycle. So um, I define a super cycle as the, the long cycle between two depressions. And I think we're in the final decade of that super cycle. I think it goes on into the balance of this decade. And then, you know, we get another huge depression, but we're also, we're also in the 41st year of a secular bull market that started in August of 1982. I date it back to then uh, as a secular bull market because that's when interest rates and inflation began trending down. And that's really what drove the markets uh, you know, all the, to, you know, many multiples of what they were back then because you had, you know, you had back then 15, 20% interest rates in the US as they moved to almost zero back in 2020, the PE multiple moved in the opposite direction. So, you know, you started out this bull market back in 1982 with seven or eight times earnings, and you're now up around 20 times earnings, you know, or, or were, and I think we'll probably peak out above that. So, um, so this is kind of the last hurrah of a 41 year circular bull market. And then on the other side of that, uh, and I think that happens in the next, you know, three to six months. On the other side of that um, is what I call a global bust. And a global bust, and by my definition, is something bigger than a recession, shorter than a depression. So it's not drawn out like, like the 1930s were. It'll all happen within kind of the speed of a recession. So within most of it, within a year. But it'll be the damage of a, of a depression, it'll feel like a depression. There'll be a lot of, there'll be a lot of um, financial dislocation, a lot of um, involuntary debt liquidation, bank failures, big bank failures. Um, so we're seeing a little bit of that, obviously, with uh, um, Silicon Valley Bank and um, Signature Bank. So you know, those second and third largest banks, U.S. banks, to fail in in history. That's kind of the, what I call the shot across the bow or the tip of the iceberg. And we'll go through this melt up first. And then I think you'll see the second shoe drop, not to throw out all these metaphors, but the second shoe to drop um, will be the bust. You know, we'll probably be in recession soon, but then that will gravitate into or morph into a bust at some point. Okay. I'm confused because <clears throat> you also found. <laughs> It's quite confusing because you also said there's going to be a, a, a melt up that that all the all the money is going to be starting to pour in and the shorts will be you know that'll be over and the longs are going to try and position. That yep. sounds so to me contest. like the market's going to be on fire, but you've actually just said we're going to have a bust. So I'm confused. Yeah. Talk so so yeah, that. let me try to explain that because what the reason it's confusing is because I think we're going to have perhaps the biggest rally in history just ahead of us, you know, the next three or six months. And then uh, an 80% bear market and global bust right after that. So um, okay. what, and, and the reason is because everybody kind of positioned for the global bust starting a year ago. And now we're finding out that maybe there's no busting. You know, again, my view is that we're going to have a global bust. 
the market the marketplace is not going to be thinking global bust when they're buying stocks. They're going to say the Fed tightening is over, you know, central bank tightening is ending, and this is the beginning of a loosening cycle or the beginning, you know, markets rally when the tightening ends. Um, one of the things that I think, um, if you look back, it's really been about 18 months that we've been talking about tightening because even before the tightening started a year ago, you go back six months before that, and there was plenty of conjecture about the Fed needing to tighten. That you know the markets were getting overheated and the economy was getting overheated. So the the market's been dealing with the fear of tightening for eighteen months and actual tightening for a year, and that's been a, a huge headwind that was you know big reason why the market underperformed last year. And that's coming to an end. So all of a sudden, you lose that headwind, and the markets are free to run. Um, I don't think people realize how much that that Fed, you know, the fear of Fed tightening and the fear that Fed is tightening too much, and the fear that that's going to lead to a crack up. All of that was what was weighing on the market. If the marketplace, if investors begin to sense, as they are that the Fed is ending its tightening or at least pausing its tightening, you'll get the big you'll that will begin the rally or take it farther. We really started this in October of last year, but it will, you know, it'll move up to the next level. As this market starts moving above new levels and new resistance levels, it's gonna it's gonna draw in more and more investors. More and more investors are gonna be nervous about being on the sidelines or being positioned bearishly. And they're gonna they're gonna come in. As as you probably know, um, well know, uh, markets move on momentum. Yeah. So you will you will see FOMO. You will see them, you know, it's it's fear of what you know, the train's leaving the station, I gotta get on board. So I think that's coming. So it's just that it's uh, the lemmings are just just falling over, getting themselves positioned. But you're saying that will be a melt up, which is short lived. Yeah, that's and and it is important for me to say I am I am a forecaster, so I'm for I'm a strategist, so I'm forecasting. By no means am I endorsing, um, you know, what people should do. I'm not endorsing the rally. I'm not saying this is. This is saying, <laughs> I'm saying, I'm saying basically this is what I see coming. Everybody has to make their own decision about based on their own risk tolerance and how 100%. nimble they are, whether they even try to play it. Because there is, I think, a lot of negative coming on the other side of this. The, the reason I even think this is important to know is because the way psychology works mm-hmm. People will be all in at the top if they if they aren't aware of what's coming, they're going to miss the rally, jump in near the top, and then get slammed as the thing goes the other way. So, you know, people should at least understand. I'm calling for S and P to six or seven thousand, six to seven thousand is my target. From here, you know, that's fifty to seventy five percent move in perhaps less than six months. That's unheard of. I mean, that would be historic. If you miss it, you're gonna. What are you gonna feel? What kind of pressure are you gonna feel when, at six thousand or sixty five hundred, all the strategists on Wall Street are saying there's clear sailing ahead. Get in, right? You're gonna say, well, I got to get on. I can't miss any more. So if you, you know, I'd rather you understand when everybody's bearish that maybe there's an opportunity right. than to than to get bearish at the wrong time right at the top. Um, and that and comes that, and that, that comes back to that contrarian view, doesn't it? Because yes. what you're saying is, while everybody else is bearish, there's an opportunity. But when everyone gets hysterical, that's potentially when you should just. T- and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, not financial advice. We don't know your personal circumstances, so please make sure you exactly. speak to your own financial advisor. This is just David and I talking about what we think potentially might be happening. And David is based. Um, just outside Boston in the U.S. So this is a, a, a U.S. It's a macro view, uh, and I'm down here in Australia. Globally, this can be a, a very similar around the world. But uh, yeah, you will see you will see something similar. I think all markets will be or most markets will be rallying. I think the melt up is specific to the U.S. You know, if you look at some of the other markets, they're nowhere near 
the setup that we have here. So like I said, this is the end of a, a secular bull market. Some of the European markets, um, you know, are farther down. They'll, they'll all have sympathetic rallies. They'll all be dealing with some of the same global fundamentals. Um, but it, it doesn't mean you're going to get parabolic run-ups in other in all those other markets. I think the U.S., it will be a parabolic run, meaning it's going to get the rally is going to get steeper and steeper until it goes almost vertical at the end. And that's why it sounds crazy to say you can cover, you know, um, from 4,000 to six or 7,000, you know, two or 3,000 points in, in less than six months' time. Well, the last 1,000 to 1,500 of those points may happen in a month's time because wow. it'll be just straight up. Um, if you think about individual stocks, you know, Tesla is a good example, but any, any individual stock that went through a real run-up, you know, at the end of its cycle, it, it goes straight up. You know, it goes what we call parabolic. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think we'll see in the market. David, do you think you're going to see that across all sectors within the market? And I ask this question deliberately because – we're looking at governments all turning around and mandating that we've got to go zero carbon emissions and we've that you know the world has got to change and um you know i get tech well actually i don't get tech david at all um, <laughs> but, um if we're looking at governments and the way they're mandating the zero carbon emissions are there more specific areas for example those future facing commodities the the green metals the coppers is that something that you feel is going to be a, a better positioning? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I do think this rally, and I'm, I, I want to make sure, there's we will talk about something that comes after the bust. So this bust is not the end of the world. There's going to be a recovery cycle after it uh, in you know, probably second half of 2024 and into, you know, into the end of the decade. So, but for this rally, this what I call the melt-up rally or the, you know, the blow-off rally, for this rally, um, I think it's going to be broad based. So you will get growth and you will get value. You will get um, tech. You will get in heavy industrial, old industrial. You will get financial, believe it or not. Um, you will get um, uh, things that are driven by interest rates coming down and things that are driven. So, you know, typically faster growth and things that are driven by, um, you know, an economy that's expected to recovery, a recovery. The, because investors are looking over the trough. If they believe the Fed is ending its tightening, they'll begin to look over the trough to the next cycle. So you're going to get a, a broad-based rally. And I know lately people have been worried that the rally is of little, you know, of, of narrow, uh, you know, it's been very narrow with, you know, a few of the large cap tech driving it. But that'll all broaden out, I think, soon. My guess is, you know, we may pull back a little bit more next week. But my guess is you're going to see 4,600 pretty quickly after we finish this pullback. So you might get a 2 or 3% pullback if that, and then run to 4,600. I think in that run from 4,000 to 4,600 um, and 4,650, somewhere up there, I think it'll broaden out quite a bit. You'll see cyclicals work. You'll see tech work. You'll see uh, the things that I am more um, – turned off to or don't think they will perform as well or the defensive stocks that have kind of held up through the bear market. So, um, you know, utilities, um, energy, I'm, I'm not a big uh, bull on energy. I think, um, I think oil is probably going to, I called it going down to the low sixties. It got down to the mid sixties before OPEC, um, you know, Saudi Arabia cut production or announced their production cut um, so we're right back up into the 80s. I don't think we're going to get much above this. Could get to the mid to high 80s. But I think we could just easily go back to the low 60s in the next couple months. Well, and sorry, sorry to interrupt you, David. Why are you bearish on energy, given the fact that, um, in you know, as I'm talking to you in April of 2023, more and more people need energy? I mean, we're looking at South Africa in, in, in a terrible crisis with their load shedding over there. Uh, we're looking at energy prices going through the roof. We're looking at the fact that there's the supply demand curve is well out of whack. Um, I'm just curious as to why you're bearish when we actually need more energy than ever before. 
Yeah, this is this is strictly for this cycle. I think we had our run, you know, got up to 130 with the Russian mm-hmm. invasion of Ukraine and it's been downhill ever since. I think people are underestimating. My, my whole thesis is that the central banks are over tightening. It's it's a weird cycle because mm. inflation's, you know, up near double digit or was and yet rates didn't get anywhere near that, right? So you normally expect rates to get up there to shut things down. The rapidity with which the rates were raised, you know, we we hiked 500 basis points or close to 500 basis points here in the States. Mm -hmm. The rapidity with which we saw that rise in six months time, that's the tightening. We've got a very steep inverted yield curve, steeper than ever in history. That's the tightening. People are looking at nominal rates and saying, oh, they have a long ways to go or they might have to go to 7% or whatever. No, because of, um, and we had a pandemic, so you have a lot of fragility. And we have more leverage in the system than ever before by a long shot. So we've got 300 trillion in global debt. We've Mm got quadrillions in notional value of derivatives. That's leverage like we've never seen in any other cycle, 2008 and nine, was not even close to this leverage. So all those things are added risk. The Fed is over tightening. I think ECB is over tightening. You guys are beginning to uh, maybe pause. Um, And so so I think we're at the end of that tightening. And I think we're going to find that they over tightened. It's there's leads and lags to this stuff. So right just ahead of us, even though I'm calling for a, a big rally, just ahead of us is a recession. And then, as I say, that recession will morph into a global bust by the end of the year. So so we're not looking at a strong economy. This market is not going to move up because the economy is strong. It may move up because people think um, we're going to have a soft landing. I don't think we are. Obviously, my global bust is a hard, hard landing. But, but I think for several months, it may look like a soft landing. As rates come down, that will help housing temporarily bounce. I don't think we'll see new highs in housing, certainly not here, um, but it could bounce. Um, I think we'll see autos bounce. So it could be through the spring and summer. It looks like the economy is bottoming out and, and looking better when, in fact, it's not. You know, when, in fact, it's it just takes time. The markets, uh, economies evolve into what they're going to. Oh, so, my goodness me. Again, it's hard to position as a as as our audience out there are saying, well, how do I make sure that I protect my wealth and potentially grow my wealth? Because one of the things that you said is inter- you just said interest rates will be coming back a little bit, but you've also said to me that fifteen to twenty percent interest rates hit by twenty thirty. So that's a yeah, let's, reversal. Let's, yeah, I, now that I've con- totally confused people with uh, you know the schizophrenic call <laughs> as i say this is where we are in the cycle it's not a personality thing you know i'm not, it's not me. <laughs> but yeah let's um so it feels schizophrenic <laughs> it does because we've never seen anything like that I mean, to have to have what may be the biggest rally in history followed by the biggest bear market in 90 years because the last one where we were down 80 percent was basically 2020 1929 you know, to call both of those things happening within a you know twelve to fifteen month period is insane. Yeah. But it's just it's just the way we're set up. I think it's another sign of us being so late in the super cycle when things get very volatile. Um, so, but to skip over to the other, yeah, you and I have had a conversation about um, what it looks like on the other side of the global bust. If we get a global bust. It means, and, and it'll be global bust is a an economy probably uh, rivaling the worst we've had in the post World War II era. So that's economically, it's going to be a really hard landing. Mm. Financially, I think we potentially, because of all that leverage and because of central bank error, I think we potentially could have um, a financial crisis that's the worst in history. So worse than two thousand eight nine. And so, you know, the central banks are all sitting around and go, well, we need to deal with inflation. We're going to, you know, you might have to suffer some pain in the economy. What they don't realize is because they're going too far, 
and it won't show up for many months. Mm -hmm. When it shows up, it's going to be so bad, they will be deer in headlights. They'll be, oh, my God, you, you know what March 2020 was like? This will be worse. They oh, will be scared to death going, what in the world? You know, And you'll have major banks. Probably Europe is the most vulnerable um, because of the state of their banks. But you know, around the world, you'll have major banks going under. The only thing they can do to react quickly is print money. You know, absolutely. It, you can't you can't do fiscal policy in a hurry and solve this. I mean, they'll they'll do moratoriums and they'll do things to kind of stem the tide. But they're they're going to be printing money. Like if we thought March of 2020 or 2020, 2021 was big money, this will be five times that. Oh, my so, goodness. Me. So if that if that's the case, if they do that, if they turn on those printing presses, that tells me that hard assets, going back to real estate, going back to potentially gold and silver, I mean, it becomes monopoly money almost, and therefore hard yep. assets is where you need to be. Yep. Understand there are leads and lags. So they let's say they start printing like there's no tomorrow by the end of this year, early next. Yep. It won't show up in the economy. It'll maybe stop the free fall at some point within that first six months of doing it. But the economy will still be struggling through for a good year anyway, and maybe more. So you're not going to see, and inflation is going to be a lag of at least a year, maybe 18 months or more. So you're not going to be seeing all of that right away. But that money, yes, that, and that's why they'll go so far. They'll print. It's not like they're going to shovel 20 trillion. Either. I predict the Fed will be putting 20 trillion of new money into the system. So they'll go from you know nine or 10 trillion to 30 trillion. I mean, and, and keep in mind, we weren't even at a trillion back in 2008. So, know. you know, that's that's how far we've come. If I'm right, that that's what it'll take to stop a free falling financial system. And proportionally, the same thing from, you know, um, your bank, from ECB, from even the Bank of China. You know, we're, we're going to be looking at money coming out of every place it can come out of because, We've got this highly leveraged financial system that's going to be cratering. That money will, with a lag, and I say probably beginning, you know, sometime second half of the decade, so 2025 and beyond, is going to start that inflation cycle that I think will take inflation in the U.S. up to 25% by the end of the decade and take interest rates up towards 20 um, and, you know, and all the other, this is not going to be unique to the U.S. It's going to be around the world. The levels will be different, but it's going to be a hyperinflationary cycle across the globe. It will be, not, and I lived through, I was investing in 1982, ni early 1980s. It will be the early 80s on steroids. So um, people think they're seeing inflation in this last year. This is nothing. It's going to be, and it's going to be sustained for several years. Now, think about what that implies for, you know, the governments. The, you know, this three hundred trillion debt will probably grow because the the monetary, uh, in, you know, stimulus will be accompanied by equal fiscal stimulus or fiscal input. So you're going to look at, you know, if if the U.S. does twenty trillion in in money, they will probably do twenty trillion in fisc new fiscal spending. So, you know, in, in many different forms, you know, it'll be backstopping things, trying to save the pension system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, think about how we finance, how we service that debt, the debt that's already too high to service. If we add on another 10 or 20 trillion to that and we do it at 15% interest rates or on the way to 15, they can't. There's no mathematical equation that solves that, right? I mean, they'll be using their entire budget, the budget they typically have to fund Social Security, Medicare, yep. military, uh, welfare, et cetera. All of that's going to be used up just to service the debt. So what they'll be doing for the first couple of years, because inflation's going to start from negative because we'll be in deflation in the bus. So it'll start at negative. So it'll take a couple of years for it to get above 5%, right? Right. You know, they'll go negative to maybe one or two percent the first year and then four or five percent. And then all of a sudden it goes five to ten 
10 to 15, 15 to 20, you know, so, um, so in the first couple of years, they'll be trying to, they'll be obviously dealing with lower interest rates. So they'll be able to fund it for a while, but as the rates move up and as their budget starts getting constrained, they're going to be doing the very most dangerous thing you can do, which is floating more debt to service your debt. I get that, but let me throw a curveball at you. David, central bank digital currency, why don't they just turn around and go, let's just wipe out all this extraordinary monopoly money and start again. And so I have a question. Everything. Yeah, I have a question for you. If they do that, how about all the people and all the institutions? Well, we just saw it with uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Mm -hmm. What if you just wipe out all that debt to the government is somebody else's asset? So you can't. How do you do that? You can't wipe out debt because you're wiping out the asset. You'll, you know, that will that will basically say the end of the world. I mean, it's impossible. I, I laugh when people say, "Oh, we're just going to reset." Exactly. How do you do that when? Somebody owns that debt. Well, you know, the banks I, own that debt. People I understand own that debt. what you're saying that there's a you know there's a there's a there's a debt and there's a there's a credit. There's like, an asset and a liability. Correct. But right, and and the U.S. dollar is the currently the federal, uh, sorry, is the world's reserve currency. Reserve currency. Yep. But right now we're seeing a little bit of a shift with the BRICS and the movement to that, and I'm looking at it and thinking, you know. Is there going to be, I understand what you're saying about the economy, but I wonder if there's going to be a complete shift away from the US dollar because Russia and China, uh, India, these are big, big markets are turning around saying, we don't need the US dollar anymore. And on top of that, I'm watching central banks buying gold in bigger volumes than they ever have done in the past. Yeah, not, and not, not mostly... China and Russia. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they're the ones that are buying gold because uh, you can see their plan. It's pretty obvious. They intend to wipe out the dollar as reserve currency. And they know that that was our big, that was the thing that gave us the ace in the hole. That was our, that was why we were so powerful. Yeah. So their whole intent is to do that. And I think to some extent, this whole, you know, moving us into what I'm describing maybe they had a role in that. I don't know whether this is just psychology at work or whatever, or, you know, or super cycle at its end, but, but it fits, it fits their, their um, desires because the Western world is going to be in a whole heap of trouble. Yeah. So, but in terms of reserve currency, my take on it, and I'm no expert, but I don't think um, that it makes a lot of headlines and certainly you're going to see you're going to see you know Saudi's trade with China and in, in uh without the dollar and you're going to see in places where it's going to happen but the the dollar is not going away as a reserve currency in the next 5 years i think it it could after that and i think i have you know what i'm describing in terms of that big run up in rates and inflation and and you know what it basically will bankrupt every government how how do we fund that debt? It ultimately leads to a collapse of the system. I I think the 2030s are, you know, something that I can't even imagine. Uh, I I sometimes say imagine, imagine because this is what I you know I'm I'm calling for a collapse of the U.S. government, a collapse of Australia, a collapse of any uh, Canadian government, etc., a collapse of Europe. Um, how can they fund their debt? when interest rates are that high. And people can say, well, how about yield curve control? Look at what Japan's done. We'll just keep our rates low. That's impossible. You know, rates move with inflation. You can you can play some games to kind of delay it somewhat, but then it just makes it worse when it happens. So, so I, you know, yield curve control and modern monetary theory are, are laughable. They, they yeah. have no way of working in this environment. So, so if we're going to move towards a collapse, I, I I predict, or I don't predict. I say this is this is what I could foresee. A you know, if you're look, talking about twenty percent interest rates, trying to finance, you know, a fifty trillion dollar federal debt, it doesn't work. The math doesn't work. The the government collapses. 
you're going to be talking about an economy collapsing at the same time, a depression, you know, a serious depression right. world worldwide. I could see the U.S. with unemployment rates at fifty to seventy-five percent. Holy moly! And 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 no unemployment system, no welfare system, no, uh, you know, if anything, a very small Social Security, and Medicare, and probably none. I mean, they just won't have the funds to fund anything. So I'm I'm calling for. You know something is far worse than the 30s, um, and and I'm not saying that lightly. I don't. I, people ask, well, how do you how do you invest for that? And I go, yeah. fo- focus on this decade because we've got. If I'm right, we've got a melt up, a bust, and then a big inflationary cycle coming before you ever get to what is far enough out that I could be dead wrong, right? So don't don't lose sleep over the 2030 scenario. Focus on this decade and get your house, get your financial house in order this decade. Okay, the and, that's, news, and that's, that's a really good segue for me to just turn around and say, on that happy note, David, um, uh, what, what would your thoughts be on how to get your house in order? Because I don't, I often say to people, David, I said, listen, be prepared not scared. So we want to be prepared right now. So everyone listening to this, I don't want you to freak out and, and, you know, chicken little, the the sky is falling in. Let's get prepared. And that's why I want you to listen to people like Dave and go, all right, how do I get my house in order right now? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And here's what I would say is you, you know, this is part of understanding, not, not necessarily that you have to be in the market, but to not get caught at the top. Okay, so very important to understand the risks that are coming and not get caught in the psychology of the moment when things are going to look great at the top, because that's how tops look Mm -hmm. and not to get not to get filled with despair at the bottom and be told that, you know, in the in the depths of the bust, you're going to hear a lot of calls for, you know, we're down for the decade. This is this isn't coming back. We are on the other side of the bust. And this is the part that I. Yeah, I, I want people to hear on the other side of the bust. The good news is that the indexes aren't going to do well because if interest rates go up, PE multiples go down. The reason we had a you know a forty-one year bull market, secular bull market, is because interest rates went from fifteen to zero. Yeah. We're going to go zero to fifteen and higher. That means multiples will go back from twenty back to single digits. So indexes aren't going to thrive in that. What will thrive is it will be a huge commodity cycle. We will see commodity moves that we've never seen before. They will be many times what they've been in in history. So, so gold, silver, copper, oil. I think oil's going to four to five hundred dollars a barrel by the end of the decade. So wait a minute. You, you said, said before. Whoa, 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 whoa! You said before that oil was going to come back. Lower. All, all in, I said all in good time, right? So, <laughs> so what? Oil is oil is in the global bust. Demand for oil is going to go down, right? I mean, you're going to have worldwide demand for all commodities go down, right? In a in a very bad economic environment, demand goes down. So we will in the next year see oil head towards the 30s. Sometimes, you know, I'm, my target is 35, but I don't know if it's 30 or 36, but it's, I use 35 as my target for the global bust. In And then because of all that money that's created, oil will over the course of the balance of the decade, so from 2025 on or late 2024, oil could go from 35 to 500. Wow, that's a huge so, goal. And and think of what we're doing. I mean, this is this is the insanity of our politicians, and I, I you know our our president in particular. But you know everybody else is kind of falling right in line. Mm-hmm. You know, climate change. We are we are alternative energy. We are we are doing we were te- we are telling and discouraging our fossil fuel companies mm-hmm. from searching for new um, right. supply. They're, they are all, you know, ESG and all of that is forcing the boards to, you know, not really do their job and not really expend capital to find new sources of energy. Yeah. Yeah. And there is zero chance that alternative energy is going to happen fast enough or in, in magnitude enough to prevent what is going to be a huge 
supply demand imbalance in favor of demand. So Anybody. that means when when there's not nearly enough supply to satisfy this ramp up in the economy because of massive money printing and massive fiscal expansion, it's going to lead to a, a big boom in industrial um, the industrial economy. Not too much consumer because he's going to be digging out, but. And so there's going to be demand for all these commodities, in particular energy. And so natural gas will go through the roof. Oil will go through the roof. Copper will go through the roof. You know, every base metal will go through the roof. Gold and silver will, uh, I predict gold will go to 20,000 and silver will go to four to 500 by the end of the decade. Wow. So, so for those that are worrying about the 2030s and what do I do, I go, what you do is you get yourself, you know, you get yourself into the commodity area after the bust and ride it. Just like if you had bought Apple 10 years ago, or if you had bought, you know, Tesla 10 years ago, you know, this, this cycle was the cycle of the growth stock and the cycle of the tech stock. Next cycle is going to be the cycle of the commodity. And that includes agricultural commodities. They are going to have a big run too. So, so there is an opportunity, as bad as the scenario I'm painting about the global bust that's coming in the next year, as bad as that is, what comes on the other side of that is something you can you can you know invest in and and hopefully secure your future to some extent anyway. Yeah, um, so, potentially generational wealth, not just for you but for your family. But as always, be careful. Interesting what you just said about gold. You, you made me run because you know I love gold. I run the Australian Gold Conference down here in Australia, and twenty thousand gold. Twenty thousand. That's a now very I, bold yeah, ball. Could, yeah, I could be wrong, and it only goes fifteen, or maybe it goes to twenty-five. I don't I'll obviously have a crystal ball about the number, but that gives you a magnitude that I think is in the ballpark. And silver will be, you know, will outperform gold. So. Um, because for the same reason that we're going to have this massive money printing and it's going to lead to this. So, so um, we're, we've started a run here. I mean, go, you know, it's pales by comparison to that cycle, but we are, I'm calling for 3000 gold before the bust. So in the next six months, six, eight months, you know, I think gold can get to 3000. I think silver can get to 60. So there is a run here first. But then they get hit in the bus like all assets are going to get hit in the bus. Right. And you're going to get another opportunity to get into them, hopefully, you know, sometime in 2024. And then my my and this is a, this is a message I have to all those. At least I see it in the U.S. I presume it's similar over there. All the young investors I see coming into this business and coming into the markets in the last several years. Because of. Uh, social media because of computers and all that's at our fingertips people are very myopic they're they're in and out of things so quickly yeah you know, they if if something goes up 10 or 15 percent and they take their profit and think they can get back in when you have these big cycles buy and hold is the way to go you know if you buy gold and silver and the oil and near the bottoms, it doesn't have to be at the bottom, but near the bottoms in 2024, and just leave them alone, put them away, don't look at them for five years, seven years, you're you're going to be in heaven. I mean, the you know, it's the worst thing you can do is watch the market every day when that cycle hits because it's gonna you're gonna worry about the corrections and you're gonna get out, and then it's gonna turn around and go up and you're gonna be left standing there saying, oh, I should have stayed in. The best thing you can do at the bottom of a cycle uh, like the one I'm predicting is get into the right things and then leave them alone. That is you know? fantastic advice, Dave, because I often say to people, you know what, patience will be your friend when the markets are really going all over the place. So we're running out of time, David. If I could just ask you, first of all, how can people find you? Um, I know it's Dave H. Contrarian, is it? Yes, Dave H. Contrarian at, at Dave H. Contrarian is my uh, Twitter yeah. handle. Yep, and I also I also have a, a market letter, a macro letter that I put out quarterly. Um, they can direct message me on Twitter if they want details. 
Um, I, I purposely only do a quarterly letter because, you know, the macro doesn't change that often. And it's really kind of my philosophy is, you know, all you guys react to all the news every day, the data that comes out every day. And, you know, my, my views don't change often because that's not what drives markets. Markets are trends. You know, it's about the longer trends. And so, um, you know, the, the letter comes with a cost, so it's not a freebie. Don't, don't message me and say, can I get on your letter <laughs> distribution list? Because it does come with a cost. It's not for everybody. I have institutional people, institutional accounts on there as well as retail. Um, I think my my approach and my the way I speak is pretty um, easy to follow. I mean, not not the ups and downs of the market that I'm, <laughs> I had you going both ways, but but in terms of my speak, I mean, I don't, uh, you know, I think it's pretty easily understood by everybody. So, you know, my, the letters are, I think, okay. readily understood. He tells it like it is, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going to leave the last word for David to wrap it up and give us three reasons, or not three reasons, three things that we should be looking at as we head into what sounds to me like quite a tumultuous time in the markets. But what you all have to do is not panic and be patient but the last word is to you, David. What are your three final thoughts? Okay, I'll focus on the you know what's just ahead of us, and I'll say you're going to have a lot of people telling you, continuing to tell you this is a bear market rally, and every time it stalls, they're going to tell you it's it's headed for new lows. Um, just understand, I think as I explained before, there's so many bears out there. There's a wall of worry to climb. And uh, so don't, you know, don't listen so much to what I call the noise out there. Um, you know, there's plenty of people conjecture about what the Fed's going to do at the next meeting or how high rates are going to go, uh, how high they're going to hike, et cetera. I think they're close to the end. And I think it's going to, you know, we're, we're in for a nice run here. The, keep in mind, it's a short period of time, but it's returns that are the equivalent of a full cycle. I mean, if we if we see 50 to 75 percent move in the S and P and maybe more in the Nasdaq, um, that's that's the kind of returns you get over three or four years, not over six months. So, so it's kind of an ironic thing that you you say, well, I'm not a short term person. I can't invest that way. Just understand the returns are something that are more like a full cycle, <laughs> or at least uh, several years. So, it's it's just it's. It sounds crazy, yeah, and maybe I'll be proven crazy, but it's what I see. All right, David Hunter, I really appreciate your time. Let's get you back on again. Let's not leave it too long. My fault. I didn't reach out to you quick enough, but let's stay in contact because things are moving, and it'd be great to have you back on again. But for now, David Hunter, as a chief market macro strategist, you've given us a really good overview, and I really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining me on Small Caps today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on.